Uh, now we are going to have another session. Uh, we are going to talk about economic development and central banks. Uh, we have three speakers for uh, almost two hours, I guess like one hour for 55 minutes. Uh, the schedule is going to be the, uh, the following. We are going to have approximately 25, 30 minutes per each presentation. And then we are going to have five, 10, 15 minutes per questions. Uh, the first speaker today is Enrique Mendoza from the University of Pennsylvania, who is going to talk about tight money. And the floor is yours for the next 30 minutes, please. Um, yes. Yeah, that would be good. This working? Okay, thank you. So I would like to start by thanking the organizers, uh, as well as the uh, Canadian National Bank and the DNP for inviting me to take part in this conference today. Uh, so after that uh, great uh, keynote speech that John Taylor gave us, um, you're going to find that uh, there's a lot of ingredients that follow in the same vein uh, in the presentation I'm going to make today. Going back to the points about uh, Tim Bergen, about the development of uh, macro models of uh, monetary policy, about the use of the Taylor rule, and in particular about the things that he was uh, talking uh, in the second half that have to do with the considerations about financial stability and what we do in particular about um, the interaction between monetary policy and financial policy. Uh, also, just to the, uh, a quick word about the conference in the sense of uh, the point about the contributions to development from central banking. You see from the perspective of the work that I'm going to present and my own general perspective on these issues, the contributions that central banks do to financial, uh, to economic development basically consist of two parts. The first one is uh, to maintain price stability. That's also in line with uh, what John Taylor was uh, talking about, particularly in handling some of the questions that he received. The second one has to do with uh, contributing to maintain financial stability. And I say contribute because in maintaining financial stability, the central bank is only one of a number of actors that participate in every economy. Depending on the country that you look at, maintaining financial stability is the responsibility of uh, various uh, agencies that may in in include, include um, regulators of different kinds, bank regulators, uh, securities market regulators, central banks, finance ministries, and so on. So, at best, you can think about the role of the central bank as contributing to financial stability, whereas in the context of monetary policy, it has, uh, of course, a, a much stronger role. And there lies uh, the beginning of the motivation of how we thought about writing this paper. So this is written with my friends uh, Julio, Victoria, and Jessica from the Bank of Mexico. And uh, the point here was that once you recognize that uh, there's different entities that are involved in decisions about financial stability, you start to worry about the potential for coordination failure in the management of financial and monetary policies. And that's what we wanted to write about. So again, it's a lot of the things. In some ways, uh, something almost never happens to me that uh, presentation that is just before is such a useful background from what I'm going to say that a lot of things that I was planning to say, I don't need to say anymore. So that makes my life a lot easier. OK. So there is a broad consensus on the need to pr pursue these macro-oriented financial policies. That's what has emerged from uh, the aftermath of the financial crisis. Um, in many accounts in emerging markets, we were doing already so-called macroprudential policies since the 1990s, the aftermath of the emerging markets crisis. We just didn't have a sexy name for what we were doing in worrying about uh, currency mismatches, about maturity mismatches, about uh, liabilities of uh, commercial banks about loan-to-value ratios and uh, all of that. Uh, now, this has become a mo much broader question. It's uh, even not just about macroprudential, which it has to do with preemptive ex-ante policy. It has to do with a much broader question about macro-oriented financial policies. So here I'm going to use, for today's talk, specifically talk about financial policy, not necessarily just macroprudential, in general, financial policy that is of macro uh, orientation. Now, the implementation of those policies, however, raises uh, two important questions about the potential for coordination failure that I was mentioning about, the potential for coordination failure with the conduct of monetary policy. And this is where uh, Tim Bergen comes into the picture. 
So the question is how relevant is uh, Timbergen's rule in this context? And as most of the models that we have for thinking about this kind of question, including the ones that uh, John was mentioning in his uh, discussion when he started to introduce uh, financial stability issues, uh, actually will suggest that you should have two instruments because you tend to have two inefficiencies. And I will focus very specifically on exactly one of the models that uh, John referred to, in which uh, you have nominal rigidities, stickiness of prices, as well as friction in financial markets, particularly costly state verification of borrowers. And therefore, targeting these two inefficiencies requires to do it optimally to have two instruments of policy. And that's uh, pretty much uh, the emergence uh, principle in practice in this context. Now, the question is more quantitative than qualitative. So in the theory of these models, the case is that uh, you should not do worse than having two instruments than by just having one. But of course, implementation is complex. And again, that follows from uh, the presentation that John, John made. So implementation of financial policy, if it is complex, then maybe if the pure theory says that you should have two rules, it's not so bad to just have one monetary rule that is still the Taylor rule, but augmented by financial stability factors. That's the area of the so-called leaning against the wind that also was part of, uh, of uh, John's talk. So that's kind of one question to raise. Should we augment monetary policy rules like the rule, Taylor rule with financial stability factors, or should we have a different financial policy rule? It's a quantitative question. The theoretical answer to the question is you should have two separate rules. But the quantitative question is, does it really make that big a difference? And that's one issue that we're going to address here. The second is, OK, if the theory says that you should have two separate rules from the same models, from the same models, you're going to get the answer that says that there is a potential for a strategic interaction between decision makers of monetary policy and decision makers of financial policy. So then it again becomes more a quantitative question. Here we're not going to make a point about theory being new, but about whether it is quantitatively relevant to discuss issues of strategic interaction, whether in the absence of coordination between monetary and financial policy authorities, you will have sufficient losses to justify the coordination. So this is what we're going to do exactly. We're going to answer these two questions in exactly one of the models that uh, John was suggesting as one of the better ones to introduce financial stability or financial issues into these uh, new Keynesian models. That's the Cristiano Moto and Rostagano model. And uh, the reason this model is good is because, as he was also mentioning, in most models where we have introduced the standard bernanke getter accelerator, the answer we have found to the question, what's the contribution of the financial transmission to economic fluctuations, is very little. So you start the premise of asking the question, what's the role of financial policy in a model in which finance doesn't have much to do with the business cycle? The answer, obviously, is going to be, you shouldn't worry about this. The uh, Cristiano et al. paper does it differently, as you will see in a minute, and I'll explain why. It's one of the preferable models for raising this question because it's, it's one of the few models of this new Keynesian DSGE tradition where the financial transmission matters. So that's why uh, it's the model that we chose to raise this question. As I mentioned, you're going to have Calvo pricing, Calvo price rigidities, and costly state verification. Those two things justify policy intervention. It's two inefficiencies, two forms of market failure in the second. Now, what we're going to do for Tim Bergen rule is essentially take our variant of Cristiano et al. We're going to introduce to it an element that was not in their paper, which is a financial policy instrument. And I'm going to spend a little time of uh, mathematics describing that. And it will be the only time in which I will use the math here. The rest I can illustrate with uh, what will look like textbook pictures. Uh, and the point then is going to be, OK, if you take that regime and you say, Let's start, use the standard Taylor rule. How good or how bad is that compared with a regime where I say, let's take the Taylor rule and add a financial variable, which is going to be the external finance premium. So if the government, in addition to targeting inflation, now is going to target the external finance premium, the spreads in finance, how better or how worse is that to the standard Taylor rule? And then I'm going to compare that with having two separate rules, one Taylor rule for monetary policy and one, which is a financial policy rule to target the external financing premium directly, separately. That will be what Tim Bergen would say. You need that world, two separate rules, what I'm going to call the DRR for dual rules regime. Okay, so it's three regimes to compare the DRR, the augmented Taylor rule, and the standard Taylor rule. 
And we're going to study where, how much difference does it make in the same environment of Cristiano et al. in terms of welfare? How much difference does it make in terms of what fluctuations look like when the economy is hit by shocks? So quantitatively, is it worth worrying about this issue? And if the answer to that is yes, it's better to have dual rules, then the next question becomes relevant. The problem with dual rules is a strategic interaction, is that the two authorities acting independently, unilaterally, will attain a suboptimal equilibrium, where the policies will be undermining each other. So what we're going to do is to characterize that, reaction functions, another issue that, uh, that uh, John brought to the front, but we're going to place them in the context of the financial authority's best response in terms of the design of its rule against the monetary policy authority's decision of the best design of its rule. They're going to be playing against each other, first a national cooperative game, and we're going to compare that with coordination. So the difference between those two is a measure of the cost of the strategic interaction. So if that number is small, if the welfare loss embedded in the lack of coordination is small, then the answer to the question, should we worry about strategic interaction, is no. But if the loss is, la is large, then the answer to the question, should we worry about how financial and monetary authorities coordinate, uh, is yes, then is large, then the, the answer to the question is yes. So let me advance the results, particularly if I run out of time. So this is a paper we have already finished and it's posted on my web page and it's coming out in various working paper series. So if you want to read the details, you will find them there or we can discuss them later. But let me give you the gist of the findings. So the first one is this. Tim Berger's rule is quantitatively relevant. Precisely what it means is that even if you try the augmented Taylor rule, this notion of leaning against the wind, that's going to yield you a welfare loss of 15% relative to the dual rules regime. Exactly the convergent rule principle saying, if you have one rule that you're trying to use to target two inefficiencies, as opposed to having two separate rules to target two inefficiencies, the second regime is 15% better in terms of social welfare. We're going to compute here social welfare by calculating consumption compensating variations where we ask individuals in this uh, laboratory economy what it will take to make you as well off if you live in one regime as compared to the other. So that's when you see me say welfare, that's what I mean. Consumption equivalent variation in the lifetime utility of the economy. Not only that, you can also characterize the direction in which uh, things go wrong. So policies will be too tight in the two directions. That's why we call the paper tight money, tight credit. In the um, advanced Taylor rule, the augmented Taylor rule, this leaning against the wind, you will end up with a policy that responds too much to inflation and not enough to worsening financial conditions. So in that sense, it's tight money, tight credit. Now, of course, what we also will find out is that uh, using the standard Taylor rule is the worst of all worlds in this setup. So yes, using the augmented Taylor rule, leaning, leaning against the wind is better than not. But having two separate rules dominates the other two alternatives. Well, then we say the answer to the question then here is that yes, the best world is to have two separate rules. But then we have the issue of potential strategic interaction. So once we find this result, we kind of are uh, required to answer the next question, which is, uh, I don't know what happened with this, uh, sort of, okay. Um, OK, so we're going to compute the reaction functions that tell us if you're choosing the elasticities of each of the rule, one authority is choosing the elasticity of the Taylor rule, the other authority is choosing the elasticity of the financial policy rule, and you play the game Nash, you're looking at what's your best response given the other authority's elasticity choice. We're going to trace that reaction curve for the financial authority. We're going to trace computationally that reaction curve for the monetary authority. The first thing that we find there is that the spillovers across the two policies are indeed strong. Not only that, they change nature from a strategic complements to a strategic substitutes. Whether one elasticity will rise will be optimal to increase as the other authority increases its elasticity, or whether it's optimal to decrease your elasticity if the other authority increases elasticity. So that's the difference between substitutes and complements in a strategic sense. OK, so that's the uh, next step. And after we do that, then we're going to say, all right, so now we can solve for the Nash equilibrium, and we solve for cooperative equilibria that are supported by coordination. And we calculate the welfare loss, and what we find is that uh, the Nash equilibrium is going to imply a loss of 7.3% over the, well, I'm going to define the first best policy in a few minutes. 
But in particular, relative to cooperation, you will have a welfare loss of 6%. So the welfare cost or the lack of coordination of the policies in this quantifiable experiment is exactly 6%. And again, you get rules that are too tight. So the response will be too tight for uh, increasing and re in response to inflation too much relative to the first best and not relaxing financial conditions enough when financial markets worsen um, relative to the first best. So you get similar flavor as the failure that you have with the, with the Tim Bergen rule. Now, the standard Taylor rule continues to be the absolute worst of all these regimes. It's even inferior to the Nash by a 25% welfare loss. So it seems that even if the best that you could attain is an environment where the financial authorities are not going to coordinate, are going to play non-cooperatively, the outcome of that, that Nash equilibrium, is still preferable to a world where uh, you continue using the standard Taylor rule. So you can take the overall message of all three saying, yes, financial considerations should be taken into account. And if you cannot take them into account through coordination, still leaving the two authorities play non-cooperatively can be better than uh, not taking financial considerations into account. You can also, and this also reflects some of the comments that John was saying, you can also think about uh, playing with the distribution of the gains or the benefits between the monetary and the financial authority. In this class of models, it turns out that the benefits of financial stability are sort of slow moving. The benefits of monetary policy play all the time because inflation is so variable. So in the set of these models, the monetary authority tends to be more powerful than the financial authority. So if you bias the game of the cooperative game in favor of the weakest player, which in these models, again, is the financial authority, you can actually get pretty close to the first best. So you put a weight of 87% in the financial authority and then have a cooperative game. What you'll end up is having almost the same as the first best. OK, so it's uh, Cristiano et al. So if you know Cristiano et al, that's what I'm going to be talking about. I don't want to go through the details and all the matter of that. It's essentially you run of the mill New Keynesian model with Calvo sticky prices, adding to it the Bernanke Gertler financial accelerator, and adding to it this peculiar feature that is a contribution of Cristiano et al, that there are risk shocks. What does that mean? It means that the variance of the returns that entrepreneurs that are doing the borrowing in this economy earn, that variance is itself subject to shocks. So when the volatility of the returns goes up, the likelihood of probability of default of these uh, entrepreneurs rises. And the optimal contract of the Bernanke Gertler uh, cost of state verification problem will tell the lenders to increase the cost of lending. So the external financing premium will go up. So in that way, in that very clever way, Cristiano et al. sort of injected a way to make the external financing premium almost as if it were shocked directly, but by shocking the variance of the returns of the borrowers. So that's, a, that's why in those models you get a lot more kick of the Bernanke Gertel accelerator that you get in previous versions of these class of models. But that's uh, the rest of the details are there. But uh, essentially, let me say something. So it will be the Taylor rule. So for the monetary policy, you can think of the standard Taylor rule in the way that, uh, that John talked about as well. We're going to simplify it by taking out the output gap for the ease of the computations. What happens if you put the output gap is qualitatively the results are identical. But sorry for the games gets a lot harder because now you have two choices to make, two elasticities for each play. So we saw one of those complicated games. We found that qualitatively the results are very similar. So we decided to keep very simple Taylor rules that are only targeting inflation. The other thing that we're going to do is in these models, these two inefficiencies, the uh, price rigidities and the monitoring cost of uh, borrowers have effects both over the business cycle and over the long run. We're going to neutralize the ones in the long run. So we're going to design this optimal monetary and financial policy rules such that steady state levels are unaffected by the frictions. So everything here is going to have to be about the inefficiencies cost over the business side. OK, so let me just say a few words about how this um, financial policy instrument works, which is uh, really the only addition that we added to the uh, Cristiano et al. setup. So essentially, what we're thinking about is as a subsidy that is going to drive a wedge in the lender's participation constraint. 
So this is the participation constraint of a lender. On the right hand side, you have uh, the cost of the deposits that has been issued to finance the lending. On the uh, left hand side, you have the expected returns within a period across the entrepreneurs for each particular realization of the return on capital. So this is going to be the expected gains, uh, gross gains from making loans across all the entrepreneurs. This is going to be the expected cost of monitoring. That's the financial friction, this mu in this uh, Bernanke-Gertler model. So this will be the expected resources that are being used on monitoring costs. So this is a condition that a lender that is willing to participate in the credit market is going to have to satisfy in order to issue these loans. So normally, this condition will not have this a tau. So that's the subsidy that we stick in. And when financial conditions tighten, when a risk shock, say, is going to make the external finance premium be higher, the financial authority then they can increase the subsidy to move it low, to offset the effect of the shock. So we can do more math on that, but let me just go directly to show you uh, the pictures. So one thing that is important to notice is that uh, the risk shocks, which are these, okay, these are shocks to the variance of omega. Omega is the return of entrepreneurs. So we're going to shock the variance of the shock to entrepreneurs. When that variance is higher, the external financing premium, which is this S, is higher. So I'm going to focus then on the implications of that in these diagrams, which is a lot easier than going through the math of all of this. So think about this as the stationary equilibrium, the long-run equilibrium. Remember I said we are neutralizing the long-run non-neutralities of both the price rigidities and the cost state verification. So think of this as the steady state capital stock. And this will be the steady state uh, cost of financing. Both of those are such that there is no external finance premium. So this is running out of battery. So that's why you see a one in the, in the right hand side <laughs> of the first bullet here. So you, at steady state, you will be that interest rate, that capital stock. You see you're in the flat segment of the Bernanke Gerter um, loan supply curve. Okay, so that first curve. You see upward sloping with the S in the numerator, that's the external finance pre. So this is the supply of loanable funds to entrepreneurs. The demand is the standard marginal productivity rule. Next one is the capital goods markets, the market for investment goods. So on the horizontal line, you have the capital goods. And on the vertical uh, uh, axis, you have the Tobin Q. And then you can map into the third diagram, which is uh, someone was asking this question uh, for John about the output gap and why the output gap and inflation. Well, it's because of the Phillips curve. So the aggregate supply curve is going to have that upward relationship between inflation and output. And that's why you want to worry about fluctuations in output when you're thinking about targeting inflation, because those things are positively related. But the point for my uh, talk is to start with this diagram. This is a steady state of the three markets, the market where the external finance premium is determined, the market of capital goods, and the market of final goods. And what, all what I want to show you is three things. What are the effects of risk shocks? What is the effect of responding with monetary policy to those risk shocks? And what's the effect of responding with financial policy to those risk shocks? So I want to highlight how there is interaction between these two policies. So first of all, a risk shock is going to move the supply of loanable funds to the left. So you follow the red arrow. That's going to result in an increase in the external finance premium and a reduction in the capital stock, which is going to reduce the price of capital as well. So you go to the second plot and shift the demand for investment to the left. The fall in investment demand is going to contract aggregate demand. So when you go to the final goods market, aggregate demand shifts to the left. So inflation falls, and you have a negative output gap. That's in this very simple diagram, which is a snapshot. It's not really a closed form solution of the entire dynamic stochastic model. It's a snapshot in partial equilibrium of what happens in one period in these three markets. So what happens if you respond with this uh, subsidy that I was thinking about for the financial intermediary? Well, if you then increase the subsidy, what you will do is move the supply of loanable funds to the right and reduce uh, the value of the external finance premium. So you could end up with this new external finance premium, this increased capital stock that's going to shift the investment demand to the right and the aggregate demand to the right. So it's a good policy to try to offset the effects of uh, the risk shock on both the external finance premium as well as on inflation. Well, what if you respond with monetary policy? Something very similar. So monetary policy is going to be stronger. Oh, I should have mentioned this. Hang on. Monetary policy is going to be stronger because notice it does two things. Monetary policy obviously matters here because it's going to reduce the interest rate that is the opportunity cost of the, of, of the funds, of the lenders. 
So monetary policy, the reason we think of it as more powerful, is on the one hand, it continues to do what it does in the standard Keynesian model. It continues through the nominal rigidities to shift aggregate demand to the right or to the left. To the right if you relax monetary policy and to the left if you contract it. So it still does that. But in addition, in this financial accelerator model, moving the nominal interest rate also affects external finance premium. So that's when you see this picture of the effects of monetary policy, the external finance market doesn't stay the same. The supply of loanable funds moves to the left, uh, to the right, oh sorry, moves to the right and down. The demand for capital moves to the right and the aggregate demand moves to the right. So this policy is more powerful, quote unquote, because it has first order effects on both the market of loanable funds as well as the aggregate supply, aggregate demand. And that's what it says in all those bullets. So, but when you s see these two plots, you realize, well, now it looks like the actions of monetary policy matter not only for inflation, which is the target of the monetary authority, also matter for the external finance premium, which is the target of the financial authority. And the actions of the financial authority matter not just for the external finance premium, but also for inflation. So the actions of each policymaker matter for the outcomes that the other two policymakers get. And that's why I said, from this perspective, you get a textbook argument that says there is a potential case for a strategic interaction to the extent that these interactions are spillovers are strong. Moreover, the reason why you can get changes between strategic substitutes and strategic complements is that to the extent that these curves are gonna shift to the right as financial policy changes, or the extent to which these curves are gonna to move to the right as monetary policy changes, depends on the elasticities that each authority chooses for its rule. Oh, I have about seven here. So, so okay, I'll, I'll uh, use my 30 minutes and then I'll stop. Um, so, okay, so that's the game. So that tells you why the interaction is present and why you could have this potential interaction. So we're gonna use a model that's very similar calibration to what Cristiano et al. has, and he also uses some numbers for Menanke, Gertler, and Gilchrist. So I'm just gonna show you the results. So here is my augmented Taylor rule. So I'm gonna have an elasticity of A pi to target the inflation rate, and this elasticity of minus A R R, when I augment the Taylor rule with the idea of lowering the interest rate if the external finance premium goes up. Okay, so that's the idea that if financial conditions worsen because of risk shocks, I'm gonna relax policy. Well, if you ask what are the values of these two numbers that maximize social welfare, they're about these numbers. 1.25, right in the range of the numbers that uh, John was talking about, and then the financial will be about 0.26. Okay, so now that's good news. Here is the bad news. So compare that augmented Taylor rule I just showed you with the dual rule regime. So here is saying, I'm gonna have a financial authority with a standard Taylor rule, sorry, monetary policy authority with standard Taylor rule, and a financial authority with this uh, subsidy rule that I was showing you before. It's a constant elasticity, so now we need to choose an elasticity here that tells the financial authority how much to move the subsidy if the financial premium rises. So here's the comparison of the regimes. So in our environment, I'm gonna define the first best to be the dual rules. It actually gives you the largest welfare gain of all these environments. So having the dual rules will be the baseline. That has those two elasticity coefficients of 1.22 and 1.56. Compared with leaning against the wind or the augmented Taylor rule, you're gonna suffer a 15% welfare loss and you're gonna end up with a higher elasticity and a much lower elasticity for uh, the financial value. Now, if you stick to the standard Taylor rule, then the loss is 35%. So that's what I was saying. The model still says leaning against the wind, which is the second row here, is better than using the standard Taylor rule. But both of those are inferior to using the dual rule regime. Okay, so these results say this is relevant, the Timbergen rule is relevant, and having the two separate rules is the first best in the sense uh, we define it. This also shows uh, very quickly the blue lines are the response to these uh, risk shocks when you have the dual rules regime, and the other lines are the responses when you use the alternative regimes, the standard Taylor or lean against the wind. It's obvious from the picture, the blue lines, much smoother fluctuations. So not only you get more welfare, if you don't like these measures of welfare, which a lot, a lot of people don't from these uh, representative agent models, well then you see here at the positive side, this is the quantity by which most macro variables will respond will be a lot smaller when you have a negative shock under the 
a dual rules than on the, any of the other two regions. Then the final point that I will make uh, is about the games. So we're going to take this approach and say, okay, we're going to have now a payoff function for the central bank, which is a loss function. It's a standard quadratic, it's an approximation of a quadratic loss function that depends central bank payoff function on the variance of inflation and on the variance of the nominal interest rate. So we took this from some of the work of John Williams, looking at the central bank as its payoff is how volatile is inflation and how volatile is the instrument they're using, which is the interest rate. So the analog for the financial authority will be the variance of the external finance premium and the variance of the instrument, which is this financial subsidy. So those will be the payoff functions of each of the authorities when they're playing non-cooperatively. So in the Nash equilibrium, the central bank is choosing its elasticity of a Taylor rule, taking as given an elasticity for the financial rule so as to minimize that loss function. And when you're looking at the financial policy reaction curve, the financial policy actor is going to be choosing its elasticity, taking as given an elasticity of the Taylor rule so as to minimize that variance loss function. That will be the non-cooperative game. For the cooperative game, we're going to minimize that joint loss function, which is just a weighted sum of the other two. What I was referring to earlier, first I show you symmetric results when phi equals one, uh, one half. And then I'm going to show you this bias result, that if you push because of the stronger weight of the monetary policy by the nature of this model, if you push phi to be very low, you can get pretty close to the first base. So the next, next I'll, show you, I'll show you one picture, one table, and then I'm done. So here is the games. So in the horizontal axis, you have the elasticity of the Taylor rule uh, for monetary policy. On the vertical axis, you have the elasticity of the financial policy rule for the external finance premium. What you have here is the reaction function of the uh, financial authority in blue. And what you have in the other curve is uh, the reaction function of the monetary authority. Notice both of these curves are nonlinear. And in the case of the uh, central bank, you see a change from a strategic substitute to a strategic complement. You see a change of slope. But not for the point of uh, the presentation is you see here the Nash equilibrium. You see here the cooperative equilibrium. And here is the first best that we will get by just implementing the two, the two rules that I was showing you in my comparison for the Tim Bergen rule, as a point of comparison. So the distance between this and this in terms of welfare, between the blue and the pink, is the cost of the coordination failure. The other point that you can see from the chart is that relative to the red star, both of the regimes, the one in blue and the one in the circle, are too tight. The response to monetary policy is too tight relative to the first best, the response of uh, financial policy is also too tight. So you get the same direction of the bias. And then the final table is this one. You can see the loss of welfare relative to the first best. If you act non-cooperatively, it will be 7%, 7.3. If you do the symmetric operation, you will get uh, 1.3. So the difference between these two is the 6% I was talking at the beginning. So the cost of the coordination failure here is 6 percentage points in terms of welfare. If you can push the value of phi to 87% in favor uh, of the financial policy, then it's almost no welfare loss. That's what I was meaning, that if you do coordination biasing in favor of the financial authority, you can undo some of the effect of the relatively higher strength of the monetary authority uh, and get a better outcome. And then once again, if you do standard Taylor rule, then you have a very large welfare loss. So this is the closing point that even if you cannot do cooperation, even if you have to stick with Nash, that's much better than completely ignoring financial considerations in the conduct of this policy. Uh, okay, <laughs> that's actually 30 minutes. Thank you very much. And now we have some time for questions, please, from the audience. So the, uh, just, just wait for the microphone, please. Just. Thank you for good presentation. Question is, uh, uh, your model is very clear, but in practice it's a little bit simple because in reality non-cooperation is not only between two players, but in case of financial authorities you simplify. Uh, for example, in case of Mexico, you know better than same in Ukraine, of course. First, how to define financial authorities, like the Minister of Finance, Minister of Economy, Central Bank, Security Agency, so on. And, of course, is the 
one player, one objective. Here is a lot of institution how to define this case. It's the one objective, optimal instruments, and after consider your theory, it's more applicable for practice. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, so as I was saying at the beginning, that is essentially the first motivation that we had for the, working on this issue was the recognition that, uh, well, on the side of the monetary authority, even there, well, you have committees, like we think, it's not one guy that decides, even getting that committee to agree, as, as John was suggesting, is an issue. But in financial, it's a lot broader, because you will have bank regulators, superintendents of banks, all these uh, securities, uh, supervision entities, finance ministries, central banks. In the case of Europe, it's even more delicate, because uh, you have European-wide and then nationwide uh, specific uh, forms of regulation, in addition to, to the problem that typically other countries have. So it is true. The purpose of the analysis here is to show the relevance of uh, the potential cost of the lack of coordination. In a duly simplified model, if you want, from the perspective of the complexity. So, so the best you could say is that in the real uh, setting of things, the, the potential for coordination failure is even more dangerous than it is in this very simple model where you have two players choosing their own policies. Now, of course, the alternative is uh, just to talk about it, but not to quantify it. Uh, to say, okay, we acknowledge it's very difficult these guys agree on anything, but they're going to have to because at the end there will be policy outcomes and we see most of the countries that are moving with these policies are moving with both of them. So more and more countries are into the practice of uh, loan-to-values and DTI ratios. The BIS Basel III has the counter capital buffer. So this stuff is moving forward. So that's what I said from the theoretical perspective. There is no big contribution here. We're grabbing, if you want, an off-the-shelf model, which is Cristiano et al. 2014, and we're using it to shed light on this question. Even though it's simple, it tells you already that there is a potential to be concerned about the risk of coordination failure in the management of these two policies. And that's, that's kind of the point. So I'm kind of saying, yes, what you say is right. What I'm saying is the alternative was to just have talked about it instead of shedding some light and saying, here is numbers. Even though it's simpler than what we would like, it's already telling you it's an issue. That's the best answer. But any, any other questions? Yes, over there, please. Just, just switch with the mic. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mendoza. Uh, it's not in the paper, but uh, there is some strand of literature which is coming up, which is looking potentially at the games, which are not, uh, which are Stekelberg games, and then they're looking at the uh, ability of one of the authorities to commit. And one of the results is typically that, um, in some cases, when monetary policy authority cannot commit. It's actually optimal for the financial policy authorities not to do their job well. Basically, it's a moral hazard kind of argument. Uh, sure, have sure. you tried to uh, have you have you tried to do that experiment where the game is uh, has this kind of structure? Thank you. Okay, so we can do the stackle very very easily. We didn't do the uh, the issue with commitment. So the stackle very is a little bit like what I was saying the bias. So when you do this bias, it's as if you make uh, the monetary policy the leader. That's uh, very similar, because you will see, if you go back to, to the diagram where I had the reaction curves, it's almost right on the reaction curve of the financial authority. So it's like you take the game and you find your, the best point for the monetary authority along the reaction curve of the financial authority. But this is a, this is a world of rules. We didn't want to really think in the sense of uh, either Ramsey games with commitment or uh, games without commitment. Kind of for the same reasons as John was kind of suggesting about these issues, that uh, we, we can do the, the theory on those things, but we were thinking about something very practical, that we shed some light, if for the same reason that we're sticking to rules in that world of thinking about the Taylor rule, if we took the same kind of stance and we say we're just going to stick to the rules for financial policy. It is a simple rule that is very similar, and uh, what its implementation are. We could still do lack of commitment and say, OK, it's a rule. But now the choice of the elasticity is done without commitment. So that we haven't done. But uh, we did have this kind of idea of focusing more in rules than in optimal policies in a general sense, in a Ramsey sense, or in a non-committed game sense. Thank you very much. Uh, to remain on schedule, uh, we, c we can accept one very short question, like within one, two minutes, and then we'll have to proceed. So one last question over there, please. Um, I had the pleasure of speaking with uh, four employees of the National Bank of Ukraine at lunch, and they were talking about the opportunities and limitations of beginning a trading relationship with a much larger neighbor to the west, the EU. Uh, 
Uh, now, Mexico has had a um, similar experience uh, with a trading relationship with a much larger nation to the north. Um, what type of advice would, do you think, the National Bank of Mexico would give the National Bank of Ukraine on exchange rate and monetary policy, given these relationships? Yeah, okay. So in Mexico, the monetary policy is actually curious because it's done by the Ministry of Finance, even though it has a lot to do with things that come out of the central bank. Uh, and the question is very far from anything I touch on today. But it's a relevant question, and I understand your concern. The trade was an enormous uh, benefit to Mexico. The North American Free Trade Agreement changed the country radically from a commodity exporter to basically one of the largest 15 uh, exporters for manufacturers in the world. Now, of course, now it's proving that uh, in Mexico we have all this discussion in the financial media saying, well, the problem is our trade became diversified in terms of uh, going away from commodities, but it became specialized in, in the sense that all of it, most of it, goes to North America, and a large chunk of it goes to the US. So now our business cycles became very synchronized. When the US is doing bad, we're doing bad. And now, of course, when political turmoil erupts, the Mexican peso is going on like this, depending on what's being said. So now there is a lot of discussion, not about the benefits of free trade, but about what we can do uh, to become less uh, sensitive to just the fact that all our destination of exports is one. The exchange rate management is we learned a lot of lessons that exchange rate management in these countries has always served as a mechanism for transfer of risk. So financial intermediaries transfer risk to central banks and the rest of society by intermediating external funding into domestic currency lending. And that picture has rolled over and over and over again in Asia, in Latin America, and in Eastern Europe. So that we learn. Uh, so the, the Mexican Central Bank, by tradition, uh, now since the 90s, has stick to its guns of uh, exchange rate flexibility because the alternatives have proven so costly. So that's my answer. Thank you for your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. You may want to change the batteries in that. Uh, probably, yes. Yeah, thank you. And now we're going to have Dr. Lawrence Ball from John Hopkins. We're going to hear something about what else national, national central banks can do. Are we so desperate? Are we ho do we have any hope? So you're going to have 20 minutes. And after 30 minutes, I will hail. All right, well, I'm uh, very uh, delighted to be here. This has been a fascinating conference. Uh, it's been very interesting to start learning a little bit about uh, the city. I have to say that the building of the National Bank of Ukraine is much more elegant than the Federal Reserve headquarters in uh, Washington. Um, so I've enjoyed my time here in various ways. Um, so the, the talk I'm gonna give is based on a report that I did last fall uh, with several co-authors, and uh, some of them are affiliated with the Peterson Institute for International Economics. Um, and we discuss a problem uh, which has been discussed already a lot at this conference, um, which is that since the, great, uh, since the Great Recession, starting in 2008, in most of the advanced economies of the world, um, there have been weak economies, and central banks have wanted to stimulate the economy, uh, but interest rates have been near their uh, lower bound of zero. And so the conventional way that central banks stimulate the economy, namely by reducing interest rates, uh, has not been possible. And uh, that has led many people to ask uh, if interest rates are zero and the economy still needs more stimulus, uh, are there other things the central bank can do? Uh, are there other tools for monetary expansion? Um, and that's the topic we look at. Oops. Okay. Um, 
first of all, to motivate this a little bit more, um, this gives a little bit of a history of how the zero bound has become an increasingly important constraint on monetary policy in advanced economies. So this is a chart which shows the major advanced economies in the world, and it has annual data on policy interest rates. And to make it easier to interpret, we have colors. And uh, as the colors get darker, that means interest rates get lower. So yellow means. Uh, uh, yeah, yellow means that the policy rate is below 3%. Uh, pink means the policy rate is below 2%. Uh, red means the policy rate is below 1%. Uh, so we can see that there's been a trend towards lower interest rates. Uh, the colors get darker as we go forward in time. Um, and uh, eventually, uh, we get a lot of red squares, which means interest rates below 1% uh, or very close to zero. Um, Japan was a little bit ahead of most advanced economies. Uh, interest rates got near zero in Japan in the early 1990s. Uh, but following the global financial crisis in 2008, uh, almost all advanced economies have had policy interest rates that are below 1%, uh, very close to zero. Now, I think it's not hard to understand the sources of this trend. Uh, the nominal interest rate, we show nominal interest rates here, uh, that's the sum of the real interest rate and inflation. Uh, over the last several decades, uh, it appears that the neutral real interest rate has drifted down uh, in advanced economies. That's been discussed by previous speakers. Uh, and also, central banks have lowered their inflation targets. So with both real interest rates falling and, uh, nom and uh, inflation targets falling, uh, we've seen nominal interest rates fall. Uh, even before the Great Recession, uh, you know, say in 2006, 2007, on the eve of the Great Recession, nominal interest rates had all would already fallen to fairly low levels. So when the Great Recession occurred and uh, central banks wanted to provide stimulus and started reducing rates, uh, they very quickly hit the zero bound. So we've been stuck with interest rates near zero for most of the period since 2008. Oops. OK, uh, this slide gives an overview of uh, the report uh, that I did with my co-authors. Uh, and I won't have time to talk about all the topics in the report. Uh, but briefly, what we do is analyze a variety of different policies that central banks have tried or that economists have suggested for stimulating economies when interest rates are near zero. Um, and these policies include uh, pushing interest rates uh, negative, pushing interest rates below zero. Uh, they include various forms of aggressive quantitative easing. Uh, they include various policies designed to raise inflation expectations. The overall theme of our report is that in our reading of the evidence, a number of these policies appear to be effective. Um, there's a common view in advanced economies that when uh, interest rates are near zero, central banks are out of ammunition. That's the metaphor cliche that's used repeatedly. We're out of ammunition when interest rates are near zero. Um, the theme of our report is that, that we, don't, we don't agree with that. Even when interest rates are zero, there are a number of tools that central banks can use to simulate the economy uh, and should use to simulate the economy because a number of tools, negative interest rates, quantitative easing, and so on, are effective at providing stimulus. And also, we don't see very great costs uh, to using these tools. Again, there's a lot of detail on the report, but some economists have argued that policies like quantitative easing are dangerous because they can cause financial instability. And we argue that those concerns are overblown. Uh, and so central banks should be more aggressive at using unconventional policy when they want to stimulate the economy and interest rates are near zero. Um, now. Um, we discuss a lot of issues. In the, in the time I have remaining, I'm going to focus on two issues. Uh, first is just emphasizing again the danger of the zero bound, the idea that 
if we continue uh, the, the kind of policy we currently have in advanced economies, the zero bound is likely to be a big problem in the future. So something should be done to deal with the problem. And then secondly, I will talk about my favorite approach to reducing the zero bound problem, uh, which is a higher inflation target. And I'll talk about why I think the benefits of higher inflation targets uh, outweigh the costs. Okay, on the danger of the zero bound, um, I'm going to focus here on the United States. Uh, I'm going to follow the rule of talking mostly about things I know something about uh, uh, and much less on things that I don't know very much about. <clears throat> so I'll talk mostly about the U.S., but I'll raise a couple of questions at the very end about emerging economies like uh, Ukraine and Poland. But focusing for now on the United States, um, I actually want to take this opportunity to advertise uh, a new paper, uh, and it's not a paper that I wrote, but it was a paper that I was a discussant for uh, just a couple of months ago. So uh, anybody interested in these topics, I recommend you look up this paper. It was presented at the Brookings uh, Conference uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, a couple of months ago. Um, and the authors are Michael Kiley and John Roberts. <clears throat> As some of you probably know, they are well-respected economists uh, who work at the Federal Reserve, and they did simulations of how the economy will behave under alternative monetary policies using mainstream macroeconomic models for the U.S., uh, including the Federal Reserve's model, the FRB U.S. model that John Taylor talked about. So I want to emphasize uh, these are, this is research from within the Federal Reserve using very mainstream models. This is not the work of radical economists or people who are extremely dovish uh, on monetary policy. Um, so the main exercise that Kylie and Roberts do is to simulate the future of the U.S. economy, uh, assuming that there are shocks uh, of similar magnitude that the, to the shocks we've seen historically, and assuming that the Fed continues with the policy rule that it currently is following, which is roughly a Taylor rule uh, with a 2% inflation target. And they get a very troubling result, which is that if the Fed continues with its current policy, and if we, again, we have shocks similar to shocks we've seen in the past, then the zero bound will be a very big constraint on monetary policy, where specifically they find in some of their simulations uh, that the U.S. economy will spend 30 or 40 percent of the time in the coming years with interest rates uh, at zero. And, and that will mean there will be many occasions in which the Fed would like to stimulate the economy, but is not able to do so. Um, and uh, that will have uh, large adverse effects on the economy. Uh, Kylie and Roberts estimate that the average level of output uh, will be reduced by one or two percent uh, by the zero bound problem. Um, now, uh, and, and, and that's a big cost because it's an effect on average output. Um, as Gianluca Benigno mentioned in his talk, uh, most analysis of monetary policy focuses on how different policies affect the variance of output or the second moment of output. Um, the finding here is that it's not just the variance of output that's affected, but that the zero bound problem reduces the average level of output, it reduces the first moment, and that's it's very costly for welfare. So this is a very, uh, this is a very troubling result. Um, uh, all right, now, um, Kylie and Roberts, again, use state-of-the-art, very sophisticated and complex macroeconomic forecasting models to derive their results. Uh, however, I think their basic point that the zero bound is a big danger can be seen much more simply. And one thing that I did when I was a discussant for this paper and that I'll do right now is to try to demonstrate, um, basically show the same idea as Kylie and Roberts, but do it more simply with just two or three very simple equations that I think get across uh, the main point uh, that under current policy, the U.S. is likely to spend a lot of time with the zero bound. Um, okay, so uh, the question I'm going to ask, oh, and I should say uh, Kylie and Roberts call it not the zero lower bound, but the effect of lower bound, ELB, uh, because we've learned that some central banks have pushed 
policy rate slightly below zero, so the lower bound is not literally zero. So they call it the ELB instead of the ZLB. Um, so the question I ask is, under the current policy regime in the U.S., um, what has to happen to push interest rates to zero? We know that if there's a recession, the Fed will start lowering interest rates. At some points, interest rates will hit zero. But the question I ask is, will, will, will we need a very large recession for interest rates to hit zero, in which case we wouldn't expect that to happen very often? Or will a small recession be enough uh, to push interest rates to zero, in which case we would expect the zero bound to be a more serious constraint on policy. Um, so to answer that question, I make two or three simple assumptions, So most of which follow Kylie and Roberts. So K-R means Kylie and Roberts. Uh, so I assume what I call a Taylor-Yellen policy rule, so that the Taylor rule as described by John Taylor uh, looks like this. It says uh, the policy rate is the neutral real interest rate R star uh, plus the inflation target pi star, and then there are terms involving inflation and the output gap Y. Uh, John Taylor's rule has a 0 0.5 coefficient on the output gap. Um, uh, Janet Yellen has suggested that a coefficient of one rather than a half is more realistic and fits Fed policy. I don't quite know who to believe. John Taylor knows a lot about the Taylor rule. On the other hand, Janet Yellen has a lot to say about monetary policy also. Um, we can come back and debate that and discuss robustness, uh, but for now, I'll assume Yellen's version of the Taylor rule. Um, and then following Kylie and Roberts, I'll assume the Fed's inflation target is 2% and that the neutral real interest rate in the United States is 1%. And if you just put those numbers into the Taylor rule, the equation simplifies and some constant terms drop out um, and, and we get, um, do I have a pointer? Oh my goodness. I'm sorry, I was reading. That's terrible. I was reading along happily on my slide and not showing it to you. So let me back up a little bit. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, so this is what I said before, but uh, I'm assuming Yellen's version of the Taylor rule. So the interest rate depends on the neutral rate, uh, the inflation target, uh, inflation and output with a coefficient of one on output. Pi star equals two, R star equals one, gives us this uh, simplified version of the Taylor rule. I'm glad I looked and saw that I didn't have the right slide up. Uh, the other equation that I'm going to use uh, is a simple Phillips curve uh, saying what the relationship is, is between uh, output and inflation. And uh, this Phillips curve, I think, is in the spirit of the inflation specification in the Fed's forecasting model, although it's quite a bit simpler. Um, uh, what it says is that uh, inflation is anchored at the Fed's target of 2% in the long run. However, there is a Phillips curve trade-off uh, as output moves, uh, inflation moves in the short run. So if output goes above potential, there's a positive output gap that raises inflation. There's a negative output gap that uh, lowers inflation relative to 2%. So I'm going to use those two equations for a simple calculation. And let me be sure I move to the correct slide. So if we just substitute the Phillips curve into the policy rule, um, we get the first equation here. Um, and in, in this equation, uh, the interest rate depends on output, partly because output appears in the Taylor rule, and partly because through the Phillips curve, output affects inflation, and inflation also appears in the Taylor rule. Now, the question I want to ask is how low does output has to have to fall in order for interest rates to hit the zero bound? And we can answer that question just by setting the interest rate equal to zero uh, in this equation and solving for what output gap gives us a zero interest rate. Uh, and the answer is uh, we get an output gap of negative 2.2, or, or uh, we hit the zero bound if output falls 2.2% uh, below potential. Now, the key thing to recognize here is that if, if output falls 2.2% below potential, ooh, okay, um, can I have three more since I gave them up before? Okay, <laughs> I underestimated, uh, but no more than that. Um, uh, 
uh, that, that uh, if output falls 2.2 percent below potential, um, that's a, a very mild uh, economic downturn. Um, in the U.S., uh, economists think that Oaken's law says uh, that a one-point decrease in output raises the unemployment rate by half a percentage point. So saying that output is 2.2 percent below potential um, means the unemployment rate rises 1.1 uh, points um, above its natural rate, uh, which again is a very mild re uh, recession. And again, I'll try to speed up a little bit. Um, historically in the U.S., in seven of the last eight recessions, the unemployment rate has risen more than 1.1 points above the natural rate, as estimated by the Congressional Budget Office. Uh, and that means we don't need a great recession or a finan huge financial crisis to make the zero bound a problem, that if um, uh, even a mild recession will uh, cause interest rates to hit zero. In the U.S. in the last 50 years, on average, there's been one recession every seven years. So if in the future there's one recession every seven years and most recessions cause interest rates to hit zero, uh, that will happen often and the economy will spend a lot of time near the zero bound and that will have very adverse effects on output. So um, maybe actually, because I, I do want to leave time for discussion, I will s just skip over this slide and ask um, what should we do about this problem? Um, and um, uh, my personal opinion is that uh, the Fed should increase its inflation target, uh, uh, perhaps from 2 percent to 4 percent. So it's easy to see why this would go in the direction of reducing the zero bound problem, um, that um, if we uh, since the steady state uh, nominal interest rate is the neutral real interest rate plus inflation, if we raise, I have the numbers here, but if we raise the inflation target by two percentage points, uh, we raise the steady state nominal interest rate by 200 per two percentage points, and um, we have um, uh, 200, uh, two extra percentage points or 200 basis points of monetary easing we can do uh, before interest rates hit zero. And again, I don't have time to go through this in detail, but um, in the Geneva report uh, that we did, we do some simulations and ask uh, how different would the Great Recession have been uh, if, um, if uh, we had entered with a higher inflation target and a conservative estimate is that um, the output losses would have been uh, smaller by at least uh, 10 percentage points of annual GDP. So a higher inflation target would uh, greatly reduce uh, the damage caused by the zero lower bound. All right. Now, uh, of course, uh, many economists and policymakers, uh, most policymakers in the U.S., uh, oppose the idea of a higher inflation target. And um, uh, th that, of course, is because they think inflation is costly. And since inflation is costly, we shouldn't raise the inflation target. How, how, many, how many minutes? Okay. All right. So I, I could speak for many hours on this, uh, but uh, uh, briefly, um, there's evidence that if inflation gets to 40 percent in the Ukraine, that's a bad thing, and it's good that inflation has come down. If inflation is 10 or 15 percent, maybe that's still a bad thing, and inflation should come down further. Uh, however, in my reading of the literature, there's no credible evidence that once inflation is down to 4 percent, that um, there's any additional benefit to reducing it from 4 percent to 2 percent. Again, I don't really have time, but I recommend this paper by Nakamura and Steinson, uh, which um, is a critique of recent research with new Keynesian models about the cost of inflation. And um, I just mention that um, when Paul Volcker reduced inflation in the United States and, and people stopped thinking inflation was a problem, inflation was actually 4 percent. So if 4 percent was low enough for Paul Volcker, I think it's low enough for us today. So, so overall, again, I don't really have time to go through details, but um, I think the costs of in the U.S. of raising the inflation target to 4 percent would be small and the benefits uh, would be large by reducing the zero bound problem. Okay, so finally, so um, uh, it's a, a good thing I don't have much time for this slide because it's an area where everybody else knows more than I do. 
how relevant is this for emerging economies? Well, if the optimal inflation target in the U.S. is, let's say, 4%, um, does that mean that Ukraine and Poland should also have a 4% inflation target? Well, maybe yes, maybe no. You can argue the case both ways. On the one hand, I think you might argue that in emerging economies, the neutral real interest rate is higher than in the U.S. And um, for, again, I don't have time for the details, but with a higher neutral real interest rate, that suggests that a lower inflation target is acceptable. On the other hand, uh, in emerging economies, there may be sources of economic volatility, uh, capital flows, um, changes of commodity prices, which mean the economy is more volatile, which means you need a higher inflation target to give policy more room. So I will just uh, you know, conclude, and again, I, I will not have the presumption to give any advice uh, to policymakers in this part of the world, but just to note uh, the medium term target in Ukraine is 5%, which is a number that makes me comfortable. Uh, in Poland, the target is 2.5%, which again, hastening to say I'm not very well informed about Poland, and the number 2.5% makes me a little bit worried about the zero bound. Uh, and, and then just finally, if we just look at current policy interest rates uh, in the Ukraine, we're at least right now far away from zero. Uh, in, in Poland, my understanding is the policy rate is, is rather close to zero. So if there were a substantial adverse shock, uh, then the, and, and uh, the Central Bank of Poland wanted to reduce interest rates, they would hit zero pretty quickly. There may be features of the Polish economy uh, that mean I shouldn't worry about this problem. Uh, and if that's the case, somebody from Poland can explain that to me. But I just want to raise this as a question for thinking and research uh, in uh, uh, the central banks in this region. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we're open the floor for the discussion. The first question is over here, please. Ivan Medvedsky, postgraduate of Finance Department of Kiev National Economic Name, Dr. Vadim Hetman. Thank you, Professor Ball, for your very interesting uh, report and presentation. Uh, my question what macroeconomic and macrofinancial stabilizers uh, for, do, do you view for the ensuring of the medium term and long term stability in the development uh, of national economy? I'm sorry, the question about financial stability? Um, uh, macroeconomic and macrofinancial st stabilizers. What, what are the, the tools for? Um, oh, yes, tools, yes. Um, I, I think I don't have anything uh, ter terribly original to say. I'll, I'll endorse Enrique's idea that um, monetary tools and, and tools aimed at financial stability should be used uh, uh, cooperatively. Um, um, that that um, just having the central bank adjust the interest rate I, I would agree is, is, is not a, a, a feasible way of both controlling macro stability and financial stability, and we need to think about a richer set of tools, but I, I don't think I have anything especially novel to say beyond that. I think the next question. Over there, please. Thank you for your presentation, Professor. Um, my question is, have you considered in your deliberations the second round uh, international effects of uh, higher inflation and higher interest rates in the, in the U.S. for international finance and then through second uh, uh, round effects for the United States itself? Thank you. Um, okay, that's a good – so I have, cons have I considered the effects of U.S. policy on the rest of the world? Um, I, I think I've ignored that, and that's probably a realistic assumption in the sense that um, uh, the Federal Reserve ignores it. Uh, I mean, it's interesting. I, I know people in, in emerging economies suggest uh, that the Federal Reserve should pay more attention to international effects. But just to be realistic about it, if, if I imagine a Fed policymaking meeting and policymakers decide that a certain interest rate is optimal for the U.S. economy, and somebody raises his hand and says, oh, but it would be better for India or better for Ukraine if we did something different, that would not, uh, that would not have very much influence on, on uh, policy. Um, I, I also tend to think, and again, I think this is echoing what John Taylor said, that if um, each central bank 
um, manages its own economy, um, including the effects from abroad uh, in a competent way that we don't have to worry too much about international spillovers. Um, so maybe I'll stop there. Okay, we have the question in the first row, please, over here. I believe the question, okay, I'll just. Thank you, David Archer from the Bank for International Settlements. Thanks for the talk, Larry, it was very nice. Um, I think I must have missed a section of the talk though, I must, my mind must have wandered off, because you started off saying, Geneva report, conclusion, don't worry about being at the zero lower bounds, policy is effective, costs of being there, costs of the side effects of those policies are not substantial. Then you jumped to 2% level costs for being at the zero lower bound repeatedly, and so we need to do a whole lot of things to worry about that. What's the reconciliation of those two? Okay, I think that's, that's a fair point. So if, to repeat what you're saying, I, I, I think um, if I say that at the zero bound we have powerful tools like quantitative easing, um, th then we, it doesn't seem we need to raise the inflation target or worry too much about the zero bound. You know, ju just partly for fun, I'll give you the, you know, the honest answer uh, to, to your question, uh, which is that when our research team was gathered together, um, Joe Gagnon wanted to advocate more quantitative easing, and Sidney Krogstrop wanted to um, advocate negative interest rates, and I wanted to advocate higher inflation targets, and our compromise was to advocate all of them. At some level, that's the honest answer. You know, a, a slightly more nuanced answer is uh, that none of these things is uh, perfect. You know, there potentially are some side, you know, side effects or, or reasons people resist unconventional policy, uh, meaning a higher inflation target would be beneficial. Even with a higher inflation target, a very big shock could push us to the zero bounds. We need to have other tools available. So you know, none of these things is, is a perfect cure, so they're complementary. Thank you. Uh, there is another question in the first row. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Bold. Uh, my name is Vajagan Grigorian from Central Bank of Armenia. So what are the factors you see behind the decrease of the real interest rate? And what would be your advice if we see it decline further, like to minus one, minus one, for example? Well, again, a lot of people have written about this, and I'm not sure I have any particular expertise. Um, I think high levels of world savings, demographic changes, I think are among the things uh, that have pushed real rates down. Um, Again, this is a big topic. Um, I, I, don't, I, I don't necessarily see uh, low real rates as being a bad thing. I mean, in textbook economics, if you have high levels of savings, that leads to a lot of capital accumulation, and that pushes down uh, the marginal product of capital and, and real interest rates. But that's a good thing for economic growth, unless the economy is dynamically efficient. Um, so, you know, you know, so I, I certainly don't think that we should, the policy should work to crowd out capital and reduce savings and push the real interest rate up. Um, I, I think. And, and I'm not sure that, that um, low real interest rates really pose any problems uh, for the economy. People suggest that it causes some kind of financial instability. I, I'm not sure that, that I see that. I think the, the, the one problem uh, that a very low or negative real interest rate does cause is that if you combine it with a, a low inflation target, then you have a serious zero bound problem. But, but that can be solved by, by raising the inflation target. And I, I tend to see a uh, low real interest rate as being, uh, as, as being benign. Uh, thank you. There is one question there. You, you next. <clears throat> thank you for good presentation. Uh, question about the increasing of the long-term target, because zero bound rate is really costly. But problem is uh, first why the central bank do not change your targets, main countries which you show in the, your presentation. I think it's a trade-off between long-term cost 
credibility of central bank and uncertainties because uh, volatility of inflation is non-linear with the level of inflation. And I think we need to, the central bank need to uh, very wait at the, this step in case if the, how, what your point of view about this. Okay, so I, so I think you're saying that central banks have good reason for not raising their inflation target because the costs of inflation rise. I think we, we could have a long discussion about that, and maybe we should at the coffee break. But, but again, um, uh, briefly, I think um, central banks say in, inflation is costly, inflation is terrible, we, we can't possibly let inflation go above 2%. The way they talk, um, I think somebody who came upon the scene and didn't have much background in the field but heard what central banks said uh, about inflation would assume that either somebody has scientifically pro proven that 2% is the right inflation rate or that there is some sacred re religious text uh, in some uh, religious tradition that says God wants 2% inflation. Uh, but, it, but it has not been scientifically proven and I have not um, I, I've uh, not seen 2% inflation in the Bible or the Talmud or the Koran. So I, I think it really, um, there, there just is not, um, uh, the, the, um, there just isn't, I, 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 again, we could go, I could go at a great length. I, I think current thinking in central banks in, in the advanced economies is heavily influenced by the experience of the 1970s. So in the 1970s, inflation got above 10%, and people at the Federal Reserve make nasty jokes about G. William Miller, the head of the central bank, of, of the Fed in the 1970s, and how stupid he, and incompetent he was. Um, and if you want to insult somebody, you say you're just like G. William Miller, and then Paul Volcker is a hero who conquered and Inflation. So I think, you know, when Alan Greenspan or Ben Bernanke or Janet Yellen have nightmares, their nightmares that somehow uh, they let inflation get out of hand again and they ruin uh, Paul Volcker's achievement and become the next G. William Miller. And so all of their focus is on uh, preventing inflation from rising. Um, and uh, so I, I think that's led to an overreaction um, that, that um, you know, the idea that inflation, keeping inflation absolutely as low as possible um, for historical reasons. It's a little bit like, you know, people say uh, uh, Germans have a, an aversion to inflation because of the hyperinflation in the 1920s. I think historical experiences have a big effect uh, on policy. And I think uh, inflation aversion is still influenced more than it should be uh, by the experience of the 1970s. Uh, there was one question. Out. Ah, okay. There is one question over there. Thank you very much. So, uh, since you mentioned Nakamura and Steinstein, so I'm not going to uh, go to the cost of inflation, uh, high inflation, in terms of a you know, new Keynesian framework, but I want to touch more about the political economy aspects, especially in emerging market economies. So, you can very often you see the. Uh, argument for increasing inflation targets, not for the reasons you mentioned, but for political economy things. Basically, there, everybody says central bank is uh, too tight for the, if you're a dynamic economy, you have to grow. This is especially for emerging markets. You, you want to grow, you have to have higher inflation target, you are uh, constraining the economy. So are you worried that uh, these moves can potentially open the Pandora box? Once you can see that even Fed can change the inflation target, so it's not written on stone, are you worried that this can open this Pandora box where uh, central banks can come under a huge political pressure with very populist arguments? Thank you. So this is an argument actually that you hear in advanced economies as well. I mean, Ben Bernanke, uh, I can almost quote him, he said things like, well, it, it's, it's very dangerous to raise the target from 2% to 4%. Maybe 4% isn't so costly, um, but um, if we raise it to 4%, then somebody will want to raise it to 6%. And then if we raise it to 6%, somebody will want to raise it to 8%. It reminds me very much of somebody discussing an addiction. You know, maybe if, if if I have an alcohol problem, you know, make, maybe having one drink does not directly harm me very much, but it'll lead to the next drink, and eventually I'll have enough to harm me. But I, um, I, I don't actually think that 
in inflation is addictive in that way. I, I think that central banks could raise their targets. So. Um, I think the, the Bank of Canada has a great system where they have a broad price stability goal and every five years they review their tactics and decide should we change our inflation target or should we, um, uh, or should we um, change our tactics in some other way. And actually they recently considered raising their inflation target and in the end they decided not to. But, um, Supposing they had raised the inflation target, I mean, I, um, I, I think, you know, you know in, in general, in, in any kind of economic policy or in life, um, just because we've done something for a long time is not necessarily a reason to keep doing it. If you have new evidence or new experiences that shows what you're doing is suboptimal, then you should adjust. So, you know, maybe inflation targets have been 2% for some time, uh, and maybe before the Great Recession, uh, that looked like a good policy. But we have learned since the Great Recession that the zero bound problem is a bigger problem than we used to think. And I think that would naturally say, you know, you know rationally, if 2% was, looked like the optimal target uh, bef before 2008, there's a strong case the optimal target is higher uh, than, it, than it used to be. And I, I don't see how um, acknowledging that and, and having central banks say we're adjusting uh, policy uh, because of what we've learned to be more effective at stabilizing the economy, why, why they would lose credibility. I, I don't see why you gain credibility or gain respect or, or gain political support by just saying, you know, we have this number for inflation target and we've always done that, so we're going to keep the number no matter how much circumstances change. Um, okay, I actually also had a question. Okay, let's, let's you be and I will be the, the, the last one. Thank you very much for your very interesting presentation. Uh, by making your research, you're trying to answer the one question, how far the output should fall in order to get the zero bound level and what central banks should do. And uh, from your data, we see that uh, the more central bank trying to struggle with the uh, output gap, um, the less uh, this policy is effective. Uh, in, from my point of view, output gap problem is not really has a monetary nature. In many cases, our out, output gap is, uh, is related to structural issue. And when we are trying to solve the um, uh, structural, pro, pro, structural issue with monetary instruments, it's not really effective. And um, uh, you see that there is not big risk between the easy money with zero zero bound level uh, policy on econo economy but if you take a look, uh, look at the debt of uh, japan and most in advanced country we see that during the 10 uh, japan 20 years accumulated a huge debt and uh, it's twice or three times more than the gdp and uh, i think there's some risk for future development of economy don't you think that the central bank should find other alternative for resolve the output gap, except of uh, in interest rate. There might be some instruments like exchange rate or other instruments of central bank in order to solve the issue of output gap. Okay, well, uh, so I think that's a complex question with different parts. But let me just say, I, I think, again, my ideas here are fairly conventional and similar to ones expressed earlier in this conference, that, um, that there is a valid role for central banks to adjust interest rates to stabilize the economy, you know, the basic idea behind the Taylor rule. Uh, and that also, if we're concerned about structural issues or other issues besides macro stabilization, we should try to use other tools to address, uh, to address those. So, um, yeah, I think I don't have anything to say beyond just I'm um, f following the conventional framework in which uh, output can fall below potential because of a demand shortfall, and it's go a good idea in that circumstance for the central bank to try to stimulate demand. Thank you very much. Uh we have about half an hour to uh, conclude the session, so I think we'll wrap up with uh, with your. So thank you.
and our last but not least speaker is Andrei Tsapin, uh, who is going to talk about the corporate cash holdings and trade credit. Does price stability or instability really matter? So since you have 30 minutes, I think you will have to speak about 20 minutes and 10 minutes for the discussion. And I will hail you in 15 minutes. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Andriy Tsapin, and I represent the National Bank of Ukraine. Uh, today we will talk about uh, corporate uh, cash management under uncertainty. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to outline my presentation. Uh, uh, I will start with uh, my motivation and uh, tell you about uh, the main reasons why I uh, carry out uh, this uh, uh, research. After that, uh, I will move to a uh, short literature review and uh, uh, tell you more uh, specifically about uh, contribution of uh, my paper. Uh, after that, I, I will describe my empirical strategy and uh, discuss uh, main results and finally I conclude. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so, uh, credit uh, crunch and uh, uh, post-crisis uh, uh, and, and uh, post-crisis volatility induced uh, uh, Co uh, Ukrainian uh, firms uh, to uh, accumulate a considerable amount uh, of uh, uh, cash reserves uh, for precautionary uh, motive. Uh, at the same time, uh, uh, bank uh, uh, lending uh, shrank and uh, uh, banks uh, uh, issued uh, Bank, bank loans only to uh, particular uh, firms. And uh, bank lending uh, became uh, sluggish and uh, maybe even uh, sporadic. Uh, at the same time, despite uh, uh, banks keep uh, and accumulated cons considerable amount of liquidity, uh, uh, nobody, nobody wants to uh, borrow, and that's the problem. I think that uh, 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 to reinvigorate uh, bank lending and to restart uh, uh, the cr credit relationship, we, uh, it, it, it's important to deepen our knowledge about uh, uh, cash, uh, cash management under uncertainty. Uh, generally speaking, uh, I would like to show that uh, 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 price stability uh, uh, is very important for is very decisive for firms to uh, uh, demand uh, uh, demand bank bank, bank, bank loans. Uh, the, uh, I worry so much. Um, uh, uh, th th this slide describes uh, uh, literature review, uh, uh, describe li literature uh, that uh, postulates that uh, uh, cash holdings uh, doesn't matter in case of uh, efficient capital market because uh, yeah, there is no uh, opportunity cost and therefore. Uh, there is no liquidity premium. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, the reality is uh, much severe and much complex, and the existence of information asymmetries, uh, uh, transaction costs, and agency costs uh, affect uh, firm, uh, firms' decision on uh, uh, cash savings. Uh, I uh, uh, 
I listed uh, the main uh, theories uh, that uh, explain why uh, firms uh, uh, keep uh, keep uh, extra liquidity for precautionary cord, uh, precautionary motive. Uh, the first one, trade trade off theory, uh, argues that uh, there exist. Uh, 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 Ta target level of uh, liquidity and uh, firms uh, compare uh, uh, marginal cost and marginal benefits uh, uh, of uh, uh, holding uh, su su such uh, cash. Uh, cash, ho uh, cash holding uh, is considered as a response to adverse shock or uh, um, the cash holdings uh, allows firms to uh, save money in case uh, of uh, immediate payment or uh, if uh, the, these firms uh, uh, face a considerable uh, financial constraints. The uh, next theory uh, says uh, that cash uh, is only um, uh, negative debt. And uh, uh, if uh, uh, a firm uh, encounters uh, some difficulty with uh, payments, uh, it uh, can uh, uh, get uh, external borrowing or reduce their cash reserves. And uh, finally, one more theory uh, implies that uh, uh, Intrech managers uh, prefer uh, retaining cash, uh, retaining cash to uh, paying it out as dividends, and uh, knowing uh, about this uh, behavior of uh, managers, owners uh, uh, exert all efforts uh, in order to reduce the amount. Uh, of cash under control of uh, the, their managers uh, because they uh, want to avoid uh, money wasting. Uh, <clears throat> um, oh, uh, uh, why do firms uh, employ uh, trade credit? Uh, uh, the theory uh, argues that uh, there are, are several reasons for uh, similar decisions. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, companies uh, try to uh, uh, finance, uh, uh, try to employ informal financing uh, when uh, uh, when. Ex uh, ex when conventional bank loans uh, is uh, blocked or uh, is insufficient, and uh, mm, uh, the important thing is that uh, uh, trade credit can be used to uh, advance growth and to enhance uh, sales and. Uh, uh, in order to reduce the stocks uh, and inventories. Uh, uh, in context of uh, our, uh, my study, uh, uh, I, I'd like to uh, emphasize the uh, evidence uh, by uh, Kunat. Uh, who argues that uh, um, firms uh, tend to uh, provide uh, informal liquidity to uh, their customers in case when, uh, uh, when their customers uh, encountered uh, temporarily liquidity shock. Uh, this uh, figure is interesting because uh, we should keep in our mind that uh, uh, under uncertainty, the share of uh, insolvent uh, uh, firms are uh, bigger 
than usually. And uh, uh, therefore, uh, granting uh, trade credit or sell in, cre in credit uh, means that uh, uh, these firms who are liquidity providers uh, expose themselves to a certain risk that should be uh, secured by uh, precautionary cash holdings. Uh, uh, con uh, the main contribution of uh, my studies is that uh, it provides evidence uh, of uh, uh, micro-level channel through which uh, uh, price uncertainty influence cash management. Uh, I think it's uh, uh, that uh, uh, this result or these findings uh, uh, is uh, uh, very crucial because uh, central uh, it uh, gives them, uh, gives us uh, a hint uh, how should uh, do a central bank to uh, uh, to to push to push uh, uh, credits in the economy. Uh, in particular, uh, my paper examines uh, uh, how a firm behave under uncertainty and how uh, it, uh, uh, how, uh, how, how liquid, liquid policy on liquidity, uh, it, how, how it works with its uh, liquidity and uh, uh, I, I, I'd like to stress that uh, uh, we have uh, uh, distinguished and uh, uh, we st distinguish between uh, two effects of trade uh, payables and trade receivables and uh, uh, as I found uh, there, there, there were uh, asymmetric influence of uh, these two components of trade credit and uh, therefore uh, we have to uh, uh, include both of uh, this uh, part in uh, one equation uh, when uh, estimating overall influence of uh, trade credit. Uh, 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 important feature of uh, my study is also that uh, it looks into the impact of uh, financial cycle and uh, immobilization. The specific features uh, that uh, can characterize uh, uh, financial constraints of uh, the firms. Uh, 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 to, uh, when we are talking about uh, our hypothesis um, on uh, the um, impact of uh, trade credit on uh, uh, cash reserves, uh, I should said, uh, said, say that uh, uh, trade receivables should be negatively as associated with uh, cash uh, because uh, first it plays a role of uh, cash substitute. Uh, firms uh, do not uh, receive uh, cash uh, right away uh, when it uh, deliver uh, the, uh, when they deliver uh, their goods and services, and uh, it uh, have possibility to collect the cash only at a certain point of time in future. Uh, uh, moreover, uh, uh, it's important that uh, uh, trade receivables can be used as collateral for bank loans and uh, this also uh, decrease the, uh, uh, the uh, decrease the cash that uh, firm uh, should should have uh, to secure themselves uh, uh, against uh, uh, against the trouble. Uh, trade payables uh, should be uh, positively related in, in contrast. Sh sh uh, trade payables should uh, uh, be uh, positively related to 
cash holdings because um, usually firms uh, um, keep and uh, inclined to keep cash to uh, ensure repayment uh, of uh, the, uh, the obligations. Uh, moreover, if uh, a firm is interested in cash discount, uh, they should uh, pay, uh, uh, repay everything in time and therefore they need uh, a certain amount of cash. Uh, all of uh, this, uh, uh, all of these determinants uh, uh, explain us uh, the link, the uh, possible link between uh, cash holdings and uh, trade payables, uh, and but uh, the relation between uh, uh, trade credits and uh, uh, liquidity should be modified under price uh, volatility. Uh, the matter is that uh, um, uh, price volatility uh, hinders uh, firms from uh, accurate prediction uh, of uh, prices and, their, uh, and firms' uh, financial flows. And uh, moreover, uh, if we uh, talk about uh, uh, the case when a uh, uh, firm can uh, offer uh, their receivables as a collateral for uh, loans, then uh, uh, it should be mentioned that uh, under uh, severe price volatility, under severe uh, macroeconomic uncertainty, uh, Lenders, both lenders, uh, uh, I, I mean those who, uh, uh, who, who issued, uh, issue uh, conventional bank loans and uh, non-financial, uh, non-informal financing, uh, these uh, lenders uh, uh, face uh, some difficulty in uh, 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 in, asse uh, in uh, assessment of uh, firm credit worthiness, of, I mean uh, the credit worthiness of uh, uh, the partners, of uh, counterparts. And uh, it, it, certainly it uh, restricts and it uh, changes the relationship between uh, uh, cash and tra trade credit. I extended, uh, in my paper, I extended the uh, model uh, suggested by uh, Kid Baum with uh, uh, his authors. Uh, I, uh, I show only reduced form regression. Uh, the uh, ca ca cash, hel uh, cash holdings uh, uh, is specified as a function of uh, price volatility. Uh, uh, receivables, payables, and uh, their products with uh, price uh, uh, volatilities. I also uh, add to this regression uh, some uh, controls. Uh, we, well, um, uh, which, uh, which include the de determinant that uh, can affect uh, ca cash holdings activity. Um, uh, uh, so, uh, I run my regression with uh, financial. Uh, I run my regression with uh, using a panel uh, estimator with uh, within group uh, transformation in order to eliminate uh, time invariant uh, uh, fixed assets. And uh, as a robust check, I used uh, uh, ordinary square with random effects. And uh, uh, as uh, I aware of uh, possible uh, problem uh, possible problems with with endogeneity, I also employ uh, two-stage least square. Uh, uh, my, I retrieve uh, my data from uh, the National Committee or, or uh, National uh, Security and Stock Market uh, Commission, uh, so-called uh, employee, so-called uh, SMIT database. The uh, monetary uh, 
the uh, monthly data on uh, uh, on uh, price uh, or consumer price index and uh, uh, monetary aggregates uh, are uh, downloaded from the uh, official website. Uh, uh, of the State Commission service uh, in Ukraine and from the National Bank of Ukraine, respectively. Uh, I uh, exclude uh, financial firms and those who have uh, negative uh, sales. Uh, after the screening, uh, I also drop out the most extreme uh, one percent uh, uh, one percent level of. Uh, the value. Uh, I also uh, drop out, uh, re replace for, for, for missing values uh, uh, all uh, uh, values uh, in uh, uh, one and uh, 99th, first and 99th uh, uh, percent uh, extreme values. Uh, after the screen uh, procedure, my uh, data includes uh, 140,000 uh, film year observation uh, and about uh, 20,000 firms. Uh, my uh, research uh, period of my research cover uh, to 2003 to 2015. Uh, uh, to ident identify uh, price instability, uh, I have uh, quite wide uh, choice. Uh, for example, uh, some authors used uh, server-based proxy, uh, but unfortunately we don't have uh, similar information for uh, such uh, extensive period. Uh, uh, another one uh, employs a measure obtained from moving standard deviation. In uh, our study, uh, we follow uh, uh, we follow the research uh, uh, by Baudry and Baum and uh, Kaglayan and so others, and uh, we use uh, a simple uh, Garch model to proxy for uh, price uncertainty. Uh, so here uh, you can uh, see uh, some details on uh, my uh, uh, on on the estimation of uh, my proxy for uh, price uncertainty. Uh, I uh, I generate uh, uh, Garch uh, Garch series Garch model. Uh, uh, where uh, <clears throat> where the mean equation is uh, after regression for this whole period, um, uh, I, uh, uh, doing this I use uh, uh, monthly data set, but uh, to include uh, in uh, my regression I have to uh, aggregate uh, all this data uh, to annual frequency. Uh, so um, I, I will skip descriptive statistic if uh, just uh, here I, I'd like to uh, compare uh, compare uh, two uh, groups uh, which uh, represent uh, uh, firms with uh, constraint and unconstrained firms. As uh, you can see, uh, constrained firms uh, I, I consider small. Uh, small uh, companies as uh, financially constrained. Constrained firms uh, hold uh, hold uh, a much bigger amount of uh, cash. That's plausible figure, and uh, they uh, uh, employ uh, uh, employ less. Okay. They employ less uh, bank credit and have uh, uh, debt maturity uh, ratio. Uh, M much much lower than uh, their uh, counterparts. Uh, uh, I also uh, decided to uh, uh, distinguish uh, and to, to to deepen my knowledge, or maybe to learn more about uh, the effect of uh, uh, financial constraints. And uh, for, for for this aim, uh, I. Uh, uh, I, 
I use uh, several criteria, additional criteria, to uh, split the sample. Uh, this case uh, represents uh, uh, two uh, categories of firms. Uh, the first one, uh, uh, have access to long-term debt and long-term financing, while another one, uh, uh, another group doesn't have uh, similar access. Uh, you can uh, see the confirmation of my words uh, if you pay attention. If you look at uh, uh, debt maturity. Oh. No. Uh. <laughs> Uh, on the uh, de de debt maturity uh, ratio. Uh, so uh, I also um, this thing, I also uh, learned the influence of so-called financial cycle. Uh, uh, what I mean, a financial cycle uh, uh, firm uh, can have uh, short financial cycle or non-financial cycle. If my variable financial cycle is positive, then it means that uh, mm, firms uh, uh, face uh, considerable financial constraints because uh, uh, because uh, trade receivables uh, the period of trade receivables uh, are longer than the period for trade payables. And uh, uh, in, in this case, uh, uh, firms uh, get, a, f a firm gets uh, a considerable financial gap and uh, it needs uh, uh, additional financing. Uh, I also, uh, uh, divided, or I, I, I also uh, distinguish this group and add one more criteria to uh, disentangle the, these groups. Uh, then I, in uh, this way, I got uh, four groups. Uh, those who, uh, the first one uh, represent, uh, the first one, uh, in the first group, uh, uh, the first group uh, it contains uh, those firms who has a long financial uh, uh, cycle but uh, doesn't access to credit and to the second fund have this success and so forth. Uh, let me move to my uh, results. Uh, first of all, I uh, start with uh, testing. Uh, the impact of uh, liquidity or of uh, network uh, networking capital on uh, uh, um, cash holdings. Uh, the matter is that networking capital uh, uh, can is is uh, regarded uh, as a cash substitute, but. Uh, uh, the important uh, issue is that uh, um, I should decide whether I uh, uh, whether it is worth uh, uh, whether the uh, networking capital is is worth including in uh, uh, the equation uh, or uh, should be uh, divided into uh, uh, its components. Uh, as you can see uh, in the three, uh, third column, uh, uh, I, oh, I should explain everything. Uh, uh, the, 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 the third specification uh, indicates, uh, after uh, a lot of tests, uh, indicate that uh, we should uh, uh, we should in, uh, include uh, uh, trade credit separately as a separate uh, uh, term in the equation because uh, different component of uh, networking capital uh, differently exert a different uh, uh, impact on cash holdings. 
On the next slide, uh, I, I, I demonstrate uh, uh, the results of uh, my estimation for uh, different uh, uh, different specification as the, with the using of uh, different uh, estimation techniques. Uh, as you can see, uh, uh, volatility is positively related to uh, uh, oh, is positively related to cash holdings, and uh, uh, as uh, I have to state that uh, we received confirmation of our hypothesis. In particular, what I mean, uh, cash. Uh, uh, Trade receivables is, uh, uh, is confirmed to be a cash substitute. And you can uh, uh, see this uh, if you uh, look at the negative and significant coefficients uh, on uh, receivables uh, to net assets. But uh, under uncertainty, uh, this relation, this relation uh, is changed uh, because uh, firm, pro, uh, firm pursue very risky uh, strategy. Uh, in under uncertainty, companies uh, um, try to uh, return their markets, and therefore they uh, started to. Uh, sale in credits, and uh, it leads to uh, accumulation of uh, uh, cash holdings. While uh, <laughs> uh, trade payables uh, also predictably uh, positively affect uh, affects uh, uh, cash holdings, uh, but the. Uh, influence, the influence of macroeconomic uncertainty uh, refers uh, the, fir the firms uh, be more accurate with their financing. And uh, I, I, I can conclude that uh, uh, companies uh, uh, behave more uh, heterogeneously in case of uh, uh, in case of uh, uh, selling in credit under uh, uncertainty, but at the same time they are uh, more homogeneous in their activity uh, using uh, trade uh, payables. Uh, of I see. What? One more. Uh, I highlighted with uh, green. Uh, uh, look at this slide. Uh, uh, as we can see, uh, firms that uh, face uh, financial or financial constraint firms uh, are sensitive to uh, macroeconomic uncertainty, while their counterparts. Uh, uh, do, do not react to uncertainty using their trade credits. Uh, moreover, uh, only one of uh, four firms uh, of uh, four groups uh, uh, appears to be uh, sensitive to uh, volatility, and uh, this is the. Uh, those groups, uh, which include uh, which includes the firms with uh, with uh, uh, long financial uh, cycle, and uh, finally, uh, uh, one more important conclusion is that uh, uh, companies with uh, immobilization ratio than uh, than with positive immobilization ratio is also sensitive to, uh, to, 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 to the macroeconomic uncertainty. Um, okay, yeah. 
the, this means that uh, if, if immobilization ratio is larger, is positive, that uh, it means that uh, um, That, that, that uh, companies uh, mm, use their uh, long-term uh, liabilities to uh, support current activity of the firm. Uh, if you come back to the to the descriptive statistics, we uh, can see that uh, this group of firms uh, uh, includes uh, those, uh, those companies uh, who have uh, uh, large ratio of, uh, who, are, who, are uh, uh, who are not constrained uh, uh, internally, but uh, uh, severely constrained uh, uh, by uh, on the um, on the cr criterion on, on external external constraints. So um, okay. So my conclusion: cash holders, I, uh, cash holders increase as a firm uh, encounters high higher price volatility. Cash is. Uh, Expected, expectedly sensitive to the joint impact of trade credit and price volatility. And it means that uh, the models which do ignore this uh, uh, joint, uh, uh, the, this relationship can, bias, uh, can yield biased uh, estimates. Uh, asymmetric influence uh, underlined that the, uh, uh, we need to separate two effects. Cash uh, effects of uh, trade receivables and uh, effects of trade payables. Uh, finally, my conclusion is that uh, price stability uh, facilitates conversion of uh, cash substitutes uh, into cash and uh, makes uh, trade payables uh, more expensive, more costly. Uh, it beca becomes more costly, and therefore, uh, price uh, stability uh, is uh, able to uh, is able to uh, force firm uh, to demand for uh, bank credits because these uh, credits uh, uh, become relatively cheaper. So. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. <laughs>